The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. With any innovation, one of the key elements that you have to have is risk capital, the ability to raise capital to take that idea and make it real. Today's guest, Brian Chambers, is from Capital Factory, which has two sides of their operation. They have the venture side, which Brian is part of, and then you have the other side, which is advisory consulting work to startups, helping startups kind of get themselves in the best possible position to be successful and also to raise capital. Uh, so Brian comes and he will be sharing with us kind of how Capital Factory works, what they're seeing here in the Texas market. They cover the entire state of Texas with their programs and their venture investments. They write a lot of checks for early stage startups. The other guest we have on today's show is Joel Raddick. Joel is with Collateral Edge. They're kind of pseudo stealth mode, getting ready to come out of stealth mode at the time of this recording. They are a fintech finance technology company. They're looking at how to how to change the model for uh, medium and small size companies to be able to go to a bank and take debt financing to, to fund growth, to fund expansion. Many medium and small size companies struggle with doing that because they don't have a long enough work history, not enough uh, equipment, buildings, and all to post as collateral. That is what uh, they're focused on. And there's a lot of excitement with medium and smaller banks around Collateral Edge. So by the time this show comes out, you should probably be hearing more about them. But throughout the end of this calendar year, trust me, you are going to hear about Collateral Edge. So again, today's guest, Brian Chambers, Capital Factory, Joel Raddick, Collateral Edge. And uh, you want to listen to the very end, some great insights, particularly If you are at that stage where you're looking for and potentially wanting to raise uh, that initial seed round of funding to take your idea and make it real. Before we jump into today's episode, got a favor to ask, like, share, and follow. Like this episode so people see it, share it. If you have people specifically you know who could benefit from the content of today's show, share it with them. And follow us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, pretty much anywhere you will find the show Kill Innovations. And you'll also find me personally, Phil McKinney, uh, all one word, no space. And you'll find me pretty much on all the social media platforms. So check that out. And that way you stay up on on the latest information. And particularly if we're traveling around the country, you never know. We might be coming to your part, your neck of the woods. And maybe we can even meet up. So follow us and see where we're going to be next. And with that, let's jump into this next episode of Killer Innovations. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Brian, here in the Richardson, Dallas, Fort Worth area, you are part of Capital Factory. And through this week and a bunch of the other interviews, we talk about the importance of risk capital to really encouraging entrepreneurs to step out, take that idea and make it real. Give us a little bit of context about Capital Factory and what you've been up to. Sure. Thanks. Um, so Capital Factory is really a very unique organization. Um, I, I don't get to point to too many other organizations and, and, and draw from examples. Um, Capital Factory was started uh, uh, by Joshua Bear in 2009 in, in, in the middle of uh, Austin, Texas. Since then, um, Capital Factory has really become the center of gravity for entrepreneurs in Texas. We've got boots on the ground and, and, and offices across Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, and we are uh, relentlessly focused on 
uh, helping entrepreneurs by connecting them to their next investors, their next customers, uh, talent. Um, and since 2010, we've been the most active early stage investor in Texas. We write a lot of checks, Bill. We write checks um, at this pace um, once a week, uh, sometimes twice a week. And so uh, we're, we're really, really busy. We've been doing that um, for a number of years. You notice a lot of trends um, over <laughs> over that amount of time and over writing a lot of checks. So, um, and and really, uh, in 2017, we recognized something um, and published uh, an investment thesis, which happens to be very geographically focused. That investment thesis we call the Texas Startup Manifesto. And in a nutshell, what it says is that Texas is really geographically unique. Uh, we happen to have um, five of the top uh, 12 largest cities in the whole country, um, between Fort Worth, uh, between Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, uh, those five cities, ironically, they make a triangle. Um, we call it the Texas triangle now. Uh, but, um, not only are they the five largest cities, um, five of the, uh, most of the top 12 largest cities in the country, they also happen to be the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, and that's particularly unique. Each one of these cities is unique with its own distinctions. They all have their own core competencies and competitive advantages, and they're incredibly different than each other. They're all on top of each other. And the Texas Startup Manifesto is about erasing boundaries in Texas and getting uh, getting investors, getting founders, um, getting angel investors, getting corporations to treat this region like one single city, get the resources to move between this region. And when those resources move, it really unlocks an incredible amount of potential and opportunity uh, for various stakeholders uh, in the innovation ecosystem. That it is. So that's what we're focused on. So here in you know, in Texas and other parts of the, the regional efforts that we see around the country, a lot of the investors, you know, you say you write a lot of early stage, but you're also the connector to bring in other investors. Are most of those investors Texas-based or are you having success in being able to pull in investors from outside of the region? Yeah, I think um, um, the gravity of Texas is uh, undeniable. It is real. Um, I've watched incredibly prolific investors stand in our conference room, um, conference rooms in, in Austin or in Dallas and say that they'll never put an office in Texas. And one year later, uh, they might be living here uh, or they have an office here now or they're hiring scouts here now. Um, there was this moment um, a couple of short months ago um, as summer was kicking off. I remember I'm sitting in Austin, Texas, uh, on on at Joshua Bear's house on his patio. There's lots of investors. Uh, I'll refrain from sharing exactly who's on that list, but um, pretty iconic, well-known investors from Silicon Valley or recently moved to Texas from Silicon Valley. And we used to do this exercise uh, or have this initiative where we would load a plane we would put a lot of our portfolio companies on that plane. We would send that plane to Silicon Valley. We'd partner with Silicon Valley Bank, and Wilson Cassini, and a bunch of other great organizations. Um, and we would set up roadshows for all of our portfolio companies. They would take, you know, multiple days, of meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, um, in hopes to, you know, raise some money. And um, we used to do multi-day road shows, but they were always to Silicon Valley. They were LA, Silicon Valley, up to Seattle. They were Boston, New York, um, sometimes Atlanta. Um, and one of the investors asked us, I said, Brian, Josh, when are you, you know, looks like we've got line of sight, COVID's, you know, COVID's simmering down. When are you guys coming back to Silicon Valley? And it was a magical moment um, <laughs> because everybody kind of just stopped and looked and, you know, there's. 12 people sitting around the dinner table and Josh and I kind of looked at each other and we were like, uh, why would we do that? <laughs> why, you know, that we're not, we're not planning on it. I don't, we don't really think we would do that again. Um, and everybody just, I mean, in it, you could feel it. It, it became such a big elephant in the room. I think it's already well known, but that was the, that was a moment we all just recognized and go, Oh my gosh, like who's going to tweet about this? <laughs> like, um, but it was, uh, yes, uh, people are leaning into Texas, um, and, and, but it's not just Texas. Look, look, I mean, this is, you know, thanks to a lot of people, Steve Case, Rise of the Rest. I mean, it's, it's now a, a verb I think everybody uses. Um, this is 
about the rise of the rest. It's about uh, the resources um, and and the the technological capabilities, building virtual teams and virtual and remote working teams, um, and uh, and and the tech stacks that really empower that have enabled everybody to build fantastic organizations. Talent is to, you know is is right here in our backyard. There's lots of amazing schools um, like UT Dallas and UT and Rice, um, Texas A and M that are producing incredible engineers here in Texas, and everything is growing. So um, you know we're we're really excited about it. People are leaning in. Uh, it's not just investors that are leaning in. Corporations are leaning in. The government is leaning in. The military is leaning in, um, and dollars are flowing, unlike um, unlike we've ever seen before. I think it was pretty unheard of, um, or it was certainly a pretty pretty big headline in 2017. If somebody raised a five million dollar Series A round, um, it seems like I can't even you know every week one of our portfolio companies is raising a fifty million dollar round. Uh, you know it's um, it's it's changed. Right. Right. Um, I want to bring in Joel here. Joel Radke, you're with uh, Collateral Edge. You actually are one of the portfolio companies for Capital. Factory, yeah. Yes, right? that's right. And they're a, a key advisor for us as well. Okay. Okay. So give us a little context on uh, Collateral Edge. I, you know, I've read the background on it, but share a little bit about your history and how you got to where you're at today. Sure. So Collateral Edge is a fintech company, and we've created a soup to nuts model sold into the bank market to enable them to uh, engineer more loans in a risk mitigated fashion, keep loans within the regulated environment versus going outside the environment, and ultimately lower the cost of debt capital to borrowers. So my background, I've been in finance for 25 years, investment banking and private equity, and I co-founded a a company before as CFO. So I've seen the the debt capital transaction from all sides. And, and the issue, clearly a lot of innovative companies get started, venture, venture money, uh, you know, founder money, angel money. But at some point, you need cheaper capital now that you have the business model laid out and working and there's a profitability structure in place to push that forward uh, to achieve whatever the you know, ultimately what the company, uh, you know, the destiny or, or, right. or, or a bigger, bigger version of it. And so many companies in the middle market and lower middle market get tripped up. there. It is not easy to get through a bank's process and to clear the 45 hurdles that make you appropriate for a bank because let's face it, the banks in this country are ultimately backed by us, right? We're, we're right. the, we're the source of last <laughs> loss. And so properly, they have they make it very difficult to get through their system. They're not designed to take some losses and you know charge interest on the rest to make it all work. They're they're really designed to try to take no losses. Uh, and and the problem is for middle market companies that have nice cash flow streams, et cetera. There's still credit risks everywhere. Right. Uh, there's customer concentration. There's generally not a long operating history through multiple recessions. There's always reasons why that company has some credit risks that when they get all the way through the system are places where they fall out and, and get denied. What we've created is a way for that not to be the end of the story where the borrower then has to go elsewhere to either very expensive capital or go without growth opportunity. And, and the flip side is for a bank to lose what could be a good customer in the community to help them grow and you know pay fees and, and expand. We give them a way to um, mitigate that risk, provide the, the gap that was that was preventing the, the loan from getting closed, all behind the scenes, all do it in a way that protects the institution. And then we are using our fintech solution, pricing algorithms, et cetera, slicing up the, the tiny pieces of risk that was the key cog in getting that deal done, aggregating them behind the system, and then financing that as a whole in a much cheaper fashion. Oh, wow. Okay. So it, it's... Uh, you know, it's a mix of, of a lot of different things. It's a mix of technology. It's a mix of a financing company. It's a, a mix of a, you know, the, the sort of evangelical sale to a very conservative environment in banks. Banks right. aren't used to being on the leading edge of, of doing something new. So, you know, you, you know you've, you're pre-revenue. So the no. question is, 
what's who's 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 the target customer? Are these, these are are these large banks or are these kind of uh, small middle market banks? Uh, Mid market banks. So okay. between a billion and twenty billion dollars in asset size. Okay. So they're they're not your you know one location on a corner just doing mortgages and car right. loan banks, but it's also not, it's not Chase. B, it's not B of A Chase or right. Wells Fargo. These are. And it's it's funny, you know, playing on Brian's comments about Dallas. One of the ways you make inroads with an innovative concept in a conservative end customer industry is by having an environment that's active and competitive. So when we're talking to bank customers, there's no there's no real geographic limitations to our solution, but it just so turns out our first few customers that we've signed up and that will be the the first revenue are have major Texas operations or are based entirely in Texas. And you hear the same stories. This is brutal out there. When we see good companies that we'd like to bring in, there are 40 other bankers and money's a commodity. And, you know, they show up oh, at the same time. Oh, and interest thing. rates make, make capital almost darn near free right and, now. And so they need, they need an angle. Right. They need a hook. And so we're part of why I think we've generated a lot of excitement in that business is we provide them a way that they can they can say yes to a borrower and win a piece of business they otherwise would have lost well you in, in the beginning you mentioned also about you know they have an opportunity to build get a customer that also is thankful they can get the, the funding and mm -hmm. therefore create a very loyal type of a customer yeah. that lasts beyond give me that first deal work with me make me successful and that loyalty returns then think about this phil when you I mean, something a lot of people can relate to. You're getting, you want to buy a house. The mortgage is part of getting that, but the emotional appeal, the customer, what you're focused on is that house, what it's going to be like to live in the house. The business owner is focused on what their business is all about, expanding it, the passion of that. And this, this loan, this bank interaction is a key part of that. And, but today, and a lot of times, the, the entrepreneur is frustrated with that. The the loan officer doesn't come through. It's you know they're pitched. We can get you ten million bucks, but it turns out to only be seven. And sorry, I couldn't get it through. It's a negative experience. Right. But the reality is uh, that banker, especially a mid market banker, it's you know they're not in some office a thousand miles away. They're in the community. We provide them a way for them to be the hero, right? Get in yeah. the get in the yeah. frame where your borrower said my banker came through for right. me. And made all this happen. How often does that happen? <laughs> well, it, it, but it happens in a lot of other industries. I mean, we were talking before the show started about, or you two, you were just talking about Steve Case, right? And so, you know, Steve's doing these $100,000 investments around, get, he doesn't own his bus. He rents his bus. <laughs> I own the bus. But Steve, the guy who runs Steve's venture arm has been on the show. We, we were, we've been talking. I've been, you know, I know I've known Steve from way, 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 way back. Uh, because when AOL was first started, before it even was called AOL, at HP we gave Steve his first server to put the AOL system up on. Wow! And it was a loan that we somehow forgot that we had loaned him a piece of equipment. <laughs> and you know something at at AOL when AOL got huge, only had HP equipment in in the entire infrastructure. The, those kinds of just work with somebody, make the bet, build that loyalty, it has huge value downstream. Uh, there's no question. You you remember somebody who yeah took a chance. Takes a on chance. You. We want to take the risk. Well, it it it, it, it it's it's organizations like also like Capital Factory, right? The fact that they make the connection, they get you know, they help you raise your money. The next company you start up, you know, you tend to get this kind of you know recycle effect back into the funding source because. They, they they took the risk on you, even if it blows. I mean, you know, this is a thing that people get shocked about. It. Even if it blows up, you still come back to that same, you know, you know, the the, the same the same circle of of people who believed in you, who took, who are willing to take the risk. So, a question I've got for you, Brian, is is why take the risk on on the on the, on, the, on the collateral edge? What was it about? that deal that was interesting yeah this one was easy it was strictly the people and that's where it started it was one phone call and it was a yes 
Um, and that's really rare. You hear about those stories from time to time. People say, you know what? Oh my gosh, it was, it was one phone call, but it really was. Um, you know, we, we, we write a lot of checks. We'll write, you know, 50 to 60, sometimes 70 checks in a year. Um, that doesn't happen a ton. Right. Um, uh, so it, it was really pretty unique. Um, in this particular scenario, we, you know, we, we, we knew Joel's partner really, really well, um, Joe Beard. Uh, who's been a who's been a great friend and uh, got to ride side saddle with him um, as he ran uh, the Pro Jane um, venture fund. We wrote some checks together. We were in the trenches together. We learned some. We started some initiatives together. Got on a board or two together, um, and really developed uh, a great working relationship and the utmost trust and respect for each other. Um, and really understood Joe's superpowers. Um, when Joel entered the picture, it only got better. Um, and uh and so it was it was it was very easy for us to know um these are really experienced um really experienced operators uh they understand how to steward and manage investor capital very well um there's already really great indicators and really great people involved um this was a no brainer for us we were waiting for the opportunity to back to back Joe and Joel so um so it was it was a very easy decision for us um you know i i think it might it Part of it might have even just been done over text message. Candidly, it was it was you know it was an easy decision for us because of the people. So one of the questions I get a lot, right, is someone comes up with a great idea, right? How do they get plugged into a network like you have? That because they don't they you know they don't have the relationship with you. They're sure. just two guys and a dog starting some new crazy idea. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to the un you know the underconnected? under networked kind of innovator out there who's got a got a start of an idea yeah it's a, it's a great question i have two pieces of uh, of advice um one of them is um you know look look and, and not every ecosystem or metropolitan area is created equal we, we we certainly know that um so uh but regardless of where you are i can assure you um if you're in you know a top 50 major metro i mean there is a startup community you have to seek it out you have to be intentional about it. Um, and look, that may sound easy. But it's not that easy like because you have to show up. And sometimes showing up is the hard part. Um, and so well, there's, there's no replacement for showing up and participating in the startup ecosystem or in the innovation ecosystem. That's step one. Step two is work for somebody else first. Um, I think building a great startup is really an apprenticeship. Um, it's incredibly hard to do. Uh, and, and there's just not a lot of ways to gain the perspective and the understanding and the scale of what it actually takes, the intensity of what a founder goes through day in, day out, 24 hours a day, uh, the difficulties of managing a cap table, managing investors, um, uh, the, the, the uncomfortable scale, how, how uncomfortable it is to burn money um, and, 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 uh, and scale a company. You think you know what scale is until you work work for somebody else who scales a company, and so um, that's the number one thing I could recommend: is, is work closely for somebody for somebody else as they do it with their startup. Ride side saddle, ride shotgun, whatever you got to do to get a lens into it, and um, and and it will create so much perspective, and that value that somebody walks away with will prepare them so much to start a business. In fact, I think if if they do that. For two years, um, their their perspective, what it what it means to to build a venture back startup, um, is just changed night and day. Um, so it's an apprenticeship. Get trained by somebody else, learn from their mistakes, um, and get prepared to do it. Yeah, I remind people that I did thirteen startups before I got my IP my first IPO. Man, you know. You do you go through that round a few times? Bunch of a bunch of them got acquired, two blew up, right? But boy, you get a blow up, and you go through that experience. You will do anything in your in your human power to avoid ever going through that experience again. But it's a learning process. I think that advice is excellent. From the standpoint of, you know, it is it is an apprenticeship. You learn a lot in the process, and you got to be willing to make that investment to learn. Rather than just saying, "Oh, I got this really great idea," write me big checks. Yeah, I, I did. On, I mean, gosh, I could talk for hours on this particular topic. Everybody has ideas. 
minutes. Right. right. You wake up and you have an idea in the shower. There are always dumb ideas in the first conception. Uh, Joe and I came up with the idea for Collateral Edge eight years ago. We, we did, you know, and frankly, on the napkin or the piece of paper, there were the big blocks of the elements that made sense. But if we would have me- immediately taken that piece of paper, same guys, right, same guys that they trusted and went to Brian and said, we need, we need money for this, this is going to change the world. In the first 15 questions, we would have had, you know, 12 of them not great answers or hadn't thought it through yet. And that's probably what Brian's talking about, why that first phone call doesn't lead to investment most of the time, because they've gone too fast from the aha moment to the, I need money and I'm going to make a company. Right. So what we, you know, that's failing to plan. You hit, you're, you're going to war in a startup with a big idea. It's, you know, the mountains there, it's not getting smaller. It's not moving. Well, this, is, you, this gets past the fallacy because everybody thinks all the value is in the idea. It's not. The value is yeah. in the execution. You, the, that, everybody worries about, oh, I got a patent. Uh, you know, it isn't the patent's not going to protect you. Your ability to execute and to scale is where you create the value and the competitive advantage. You find it, it is a bit of a chain reaction. It's not. The energy that you put into the system to get the people excited, as excited about it as you are, both in the potential customers, potential partners, potential investors, potential all around, at, at some point that starts working in your favor. You mm-hmm. get the right advisors on your team. You get the right investors. So the next investors look and say, well, these guys are involved. That's, that's a positive indicator of they're likely to have access to further capital and success. You get the next ones involved that are, you know, as valuable, and then all of a sudden you have a customer that looks and says, "Well, your investor base is A plus, and this sounds like something I would be involved with." You know, if I was trying to sell something to HP, I could run around for a year, take everybody to you know, give a thousand PowerPoint presentations, wrap that all up a ball, and put it on the side and say, "Well, Google's doing it. What do you think?" That's that's worth every part of that. Yeah, in so. in collateral edges specific case i mean i mean my gosh i joe must have withheld the idea the concept um and the opportunity for a year from me um in stealth mode while you guys were you know when this became an idea and you guys began to to, to start operationalizing on it i remember how um how patient and how diligent y'all were with just doing some blocking and tackling. A lot of people don't don't know until you've been through it a couple of times. There's an entire period that that occurs before you start a fundraising and it's a pre-fundraising campaign. It's a pre-fundraising process. You have to cultivate, you have to steward, you have to you have to work through the challenges and, and the objections and understand how to um, you know how to how to pitch this, how to um, uh, how to build some of those key relationships. And when, when people know you're we're that serious about your process, it it amplifies the opportunity, it excites us a little bit more. Um, the first conversation, I mean, it, it it can happen, and it does happen from time to time. Um, usually not in lead investor positions, uh, usually in more follow on investor positions. But um, when um, the first time you're meeting someone, you shouldn't be asking for money. I don't like. I mean, that is that that, that is not the approach I recommend. Um, the the approach is to Build a relationship right. with somebody, establish trust with somebody, give them an opportunity and a lens to see what somebody you know is doing that, that they're going to just do what they say they're going to do over a three month, over a six month period. So we, you know, over a year long period, that is a pre fundraising period. Treat them like they already are your investor and give them that access in, into and the lens into how you operate um, as a human, as an individual, as a, as a business person. Um, so we, 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 you know, in Collateral Edge's case, we, we had a lot of that data just because of our operating history um, with the founders. But, um, but I remember, and I, I, and I knew how serious Joe took it. Like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something really, really big. And I mean, I'm very close to Joe, and I knew. I respected that process. Like, okay, and, I, and he had a lot of other things going on that he needed to, you know, he needed to, to to wind down some other affairs and create the successful transition, and um, and it was you know and it was well executed, um, and and that's what we expect and and know that that great entrepreneurs 
So, Joel, we're so given where you're at today, what's next? Oh, it's you know, you talk about stealth mode, but we're we're still half in stealth mode. That's about to end. Okay. I mean, we we haven't done a, our first release on the round. We haven't done PR. We've signed up two banks. Nobody knows that. We've got five other banks and vendor review. Nobody knows that. We've signed up our back end financing partner. So you know, we're 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 in the uh, you don't plan to fail, you fail to plan. Right. We want you cannot skip a step. We want to put all of the dominoes in place so that when we have that HP Google conversation, it's not calling a hundred banks and hemming and hawing around when they say, Well, who else are you doing it for? It's five logos on a page. And by the way, we can't get you in this year because we don't have capacity. Would you like to be in, in Q one? Because if not, it's likely later in twenty two. Oh, <laughs> right. that's what we're talking about here. And and I don't know, that's that's so this it's is, you just wrapped up your what, C round? C. Yeah. Seed. Okay. What is the total round of your seed round? Three and a half. Three and a half. Okay. Wow. It's a, it's a meaningful seed round. Uh, we, we have a meaningful opportunity. Yeah. I mean, we have, even in our internal projection, each it's the market we're in. You know, it's, right. it's the enterprise market. A mid sized bank in our target segment should do 50 to $60 million of our product a year with without changing their practices and using it competitively. If they look at it and use it competitively, that number goes up. Right. Right. So so you're so twenty the rest of twenty one is still somewhat stealth mode and twenty two oh, kinda coming out? No, or? we'll 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 start releasing some we we have a big kind of investor conference that'll have PR in November. Mm-hmm. We'll release releases on the round, our backing, our initial customers. We're you know, talk about pre revenue, but not for long. You know, yeah. our model is is sort of instant revenue per transaction. So right. we, we will have revenue here just two weeks left in Q3, but it'll be close. Right. Be definite in Q4 and a ramping into the future. Right. Well, great. And and who are who who was in your seed round? Can you can you share that? This is you know, um, um, uh, among I'm obviously not gonna not gonna share that th- those details. That that's for Joel and, and and Joe to share. But man, you guys, you guys put an impressive cap table together uh, in this part of town, uh, this part of the state, part part of the country. I mean, my goodness, it's one of the most impressive cap tables I've I've seen for a pre-seed or seed stage company pull together in this in this town. Um, it, it, I mean, it was intentional. Well, yeah, we have we have a lot of great Texas investors, but we have. Silicon Valley investors who've grown you know, multi-billion-dollar public companies. We have New York investors with massive capital pools. Oh, man. So it, every everything we've done in this, rightly or wrongly, has been intentional. Right. It's with our market. We we tar- targeted investors that could either help with the technology side of what we're doing. Or the capital side, or bank relationships. Well, it's, it's the old adage of you know, smart money is always better. And and, jo- <laughs> and and to Joe's credit, he was he was given advice by some of his mentors, which is there's a lot of people that will write a check. Yep. It matters to you who's writing that check. Yeah. Period. Full. And it's not it's not the dollars. And there, that is it is hard to convince a first time entrepreneur of that. That is just like oh. Hungry for dollars. Give just, me the check. I, I see the payroll or I see whatever. I, I'll take it from anybody with a pulse. But once you once you go down the wrong road with that, it is very hard to get back on the right road because people don't want to associate with investors or in the cap table that they don't respect or think are additive. Right. Or even worse, you can have investors that are become problematic, you know, aren't on board for the next stage or or see the full vision and and Man, that can kill a company. Yeah, definitely uh, causes a uh, concern amongst the other board members too, right? You, Absolutely. you get the, that infighting going on. So as we wrap this up, um, if people want to follow what you're doing over at Collateral Edge, Joel, where's the best place? Uh, best is definitely the, the LinkedIn page for Collateral Edge, you know, C-O-L-L-A-T-E-R-A-L-E-D-G-E, and it's also collateraledge.com either way. But we okay. we will... You know, I mentioned some of the PR and the releases. There'll be a lot more coming through that site. Okay. And Brian for Capital Factory? 
yeah. a couple of different ways. Um, Josh Bear, he's a pretty popular guy on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people can can actually get some of the raw and authentic updates uh, daily that way. Um, uh, I, I share a lot of information on uh, on LinkedIn, and, and I'm very active on LinkedIn and, and really respond to every legitimate inquiry uh, so people can follow me and some of the activity that Capital Factory does on, on LinkedIn. But, um, but there's a variety of, of, of newsletters that we push out. Um, we're a pretty vibrant, active across you know across the whole state um and uh there's lots of different ways to tap into that but but signing up for the newsletter and just yep. starting to see some of that activity which events are going on and which part of the state um is uh is a great opportunity great appreciate it thanks for coming and joining us here on the bus great. and you, uh, wish you both the best of luck thanks for having us take care so what do you think I think the insight that Brian and Joel shared with us with regards to their own direct experiences, but Brian talking about specifically what they do with regards to Capital Factory, but Joel talking about their own experience at Collateral Edge gives you both sides of the story. You're not hearing just from the venture side, but also from entrepreneurs trying to raise the money for their successful uh, business. So hopefully you got a, a lot out of that and uh, gives you a little bit of insight. Also, I think Brian's advice, if you're starting out and wanting to raise money, Brian's advice on getting engaged and showing up to help establish that, that your local relationship with the startup entrepreneur community, wherever you're at, lays that foundation for your own success. It takes a village. It truly does you need that local government you need the risk capital you need um, advisors coaches mentors and you have to have those relationships other entrepreneurs in your local area can be hugely hugely helpful so uh, take take brian's advice take that to heart and also joel's advice on what does it really take to be that entrepreneur to take your idea and actually bring it to market. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate you joining and, and being part of the community. If you want to stay part of the conversation, check out the community. It's the innovators.community. The innovators.community. That's where innovators, creatives, designers are all hanging out, um, where we work, help each other with our ideas, improve those ideas, maybe connect them with somebody who can uh, solve certain problems for them or help raise uh, maybe maybe early stage investors, whatever it might be. So check that out, theinnovators.community. You want to check that out. Give us some feedback on the shows. Also post a comment wherever you're getting your podcast from, whether that's iTunes, Google, uh, iHeart, Spotify. Um, any, you know, we're we're pretty much everywhere. Been around for since 2005, so most every place you can get a podcast, including Amazon now, um, you can actually get the podcast on Amazon. So check that out and uh, let us know. Give us some feedback. Let us know what content, what questions, what topics you would like to uh, have us cover. And with that, we appreciate the time out of your busy schedule, and we will be back soon with another episode of Killer Innovations. Podcasting nonstop since 2005, this has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network. <laughs>